Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is day 90. Day 90. 90 days since Trump sent out that tweet. June the 1st, 2017. Beautiful day here in Southern Ohio today. Hopefully it was beautiful wherever you are. And uh, tomorrow is Friday. Or I should say today is Friday because you'll be viewing this video on Friday morning. But I actually shoot the video Thursday night and I upload it and it's there for you in the morning. <clears throat> so <clears throat> anyway, that's uh, kind of how things are. It's great when you have a Monday off. It makes the week seem so short. And I actually support every Monday being a paid holiday. <clears throat> Maybe Congress can make that happen. I mean, Congress, you know, they take a 10-day uh, Memorial Day break and then they come back for a couple more days and then they take summer off to go raise money and then they come back and they have a couple more weeks. I believe there's 28 total days between now and the end of the year that Congress will get together and try to get some work done. And of course, uh, I wouldn't count on that. <clears throat> so let's talk about some things, but before I get into today's uh, Towergate issues, uh, just a couple things off, off, off the top of my head uh, here. The first one, I'm sure everybody saw some clips of Hillary Clinton's speech just remember, I did a video about eh, a month, month and a half ago, where I stated that Hillary will be, she will make every effort to run in 2020. A lot of people think that's not possible, but I'm telling you, I know Hillary Clinton. Uh, I've been watching this woman for years. She's a total narcissist. And uh, I guarantee you, she has every intention of running in 2020. And the only thing that will probably stop her is if she has some sort of major health issue that she cannot keep out of the public eye. Obviously, she has health issues. In fact, she broke into a coughing fit a couple of days ago. But yesterday, or maybe day before yesterday when you're watching this video, she was at a Q&A out in California. And of course, in addition to blaming Comey and the Russians and everybody else, she's now blaming the DNC. <laughs> and that is not going over very well with the people who work at the DNC. Hillary is uh, set out on the scorched earth uh, policy. Uh, that's her plan. She's going to destroy, burn every bridge. She's going to blow it all up. She lost and so she is going to try to destroy everything in her path <clears throat> and leave nothing but chaos and confusion in her wake, hoping that she'll keep the Democratic Party uh, in the spin cycle so that she can go out and raise a ton of money again and try to run again in 2020. I guarantee you she has every intention of doing that. So we'll just have to keep our eye on Hillary, unfortunately, because I'm like a lot of people. I just want her to go away. I've done two videos, two videos to explain to Hillary why she lost. I'm not doing another one. You know, my videos are there. If she wants to watch them, she can. If she doesn't, that's fine. But I explained in two different videos to Hillary exactly why she lost. It had nothing to do with Russians, nothing to do with Comey. I mean, the Comey, you can look at the dates. Hillary went into the convention. She was down by four points. During the convention is when those emails came out. She came out of the convention up by 11. She got a 15-point surge from the before the Democratic Convention to after, which is exactly the time frame when all the emails came out. The emails had nothing to do with it. Russia had nothing to do with it. The reason Hillary Clinton lost, in a nutshell, is because Hillary Clinton. <clears throat> now, I was checking out Roger Stone a little bit. I kind of like Roger Stone. Uh, he's been around a long time. He's an old political cat. He has a lot of good information. He's a bit of a sensationalist. He's on Infowars a lot. And uh, although I do like you know, to occasionally check out Infowars, I double check everything I hear or see at Infowars. But um, not that I don't trust him, it's just that you know, they are a bit clickbaity and uh, you know, Alex is uh, chomping at the bit. He's uh, very excitable and uh, sometimes a little over motivated so um, I wouldn't say I take things I see at InfoWars with a grain of salt I'll just say that I, I generally I would be hesitant to uh, 
take any strong position on any information that came solely from InfoWars. But nevertheless, Roger Stone was guest hosting the other day, and he was confirming what I what I discovered uh, in yesterday's video. I talked about the fact that while Trump was overseas, he said some people sniffing around to find out where the leakers are coming from, and it was reported by a CBS news journalist, and then that was covered on Zero Hedge, Western Journalism, and various other sites. Probably I looked at a dozen or two dozen sites probably that picked up that story and ran it. And essentially they're saying that there have been three moles or, or leakers found within the, the Trump administration and that they will be getting fired soon. Now, now uh, Roger Stone is basically um, telling us that he knows, <coughs> excuse me, he knows the name of one of those people. And that person would be Fiona Hill. Now, Fiona Hill works uh, for a, has worked for a Soros-backed operation. Um, and this is an operation that's running right now in the country of Hungary. Obviously, Soros is trying to take out in a soft coup the president of Hungary the way he did uh, with Mr. Yanukovych in the Ukraine. He's trying to do the exact same there. Uh, along with the CIA and other, you know, some government, some non-government forces trying to overturn the people and the president of Hungary, which is a very good president there. I believe it's a female. But um, Hungary, they're, they're a bunch of freedom lovers there. They don't want their country overrun with uh, refugees. And um, they like freedom. <laughs> and... Uh, they don't like George Soros, and they certainly don't like having these groups in their country trying to overthrow their government and their political system. And Fiona Hill was on the board of one of these companies that operates in Hungary that is attempting to overthrow that government in a soft coup. Fiona Hill is a neocon. She was brought into the State Department by McMaster's. And of course, as you all know, I do not like H.R. McMaster. I know he's a neocon. I know that the group of people he runs around with, including Petraeus and Rice and all these other people. I think McMaster was a horrible choice for the National Security Advisor, and I wish Trump would cut him loose immediately. But Fiona Hill is the name that Roger Stone is dropping, and uh, she is a Soros lackey and a uh, McMaster, one of these uh, McMaster's uh, followers, someone that obviously follows him around. She's probably taking care of Mr. McMaster on the side, if you know what I mean. Another thing that came out yesterday was pretty interesting. You know, we haven't heard much about Devin Nunes since the, uh, who was of course the head of the House Intelligence Committee who was investigating the surveillance in Russia and things like that. And of course he went over and viewed some information at the White House and uh, because he didn't bring uh, Adam Schiff along. Adam Schiff got his uh, his uh, panties in a wad and uh, decided to cry about it and that led to Nunes having to step aside. But Nunes is still on that committee and he still knows exactly what it was that he saw. He still has the ability to recommend to the head of that committee um, people who he, who he thinks should be interviewed or brought in to testify. So Nunes hasn't gone away. He's still there. He's being much quieter, but he will still be sitting on that committee. He will still be asking questions of people, and he will still have the ability to recommend uh, uh, people uh, that he would like to see questioned. But he made a very interesting comment the other day. He said that the reason that the House Intelligence Committees haven't been moving forward like the Senate Intelligence Committee or the House Oversight Committee is because he said that of course they've been stonewalled on getting information but he said quite honestly the Democrats are not interested in moving forward because they are wanting to pursue the Russia collusion Russia hacking into the election and there's nothing there there's nothing there for the Democrats nothing to chew on but he's got a lot of things he would like to look into regarding the surveillance of Trump and his team and the unmasking and the general surveillance 
of uh, private citizens. But uh, this is why Nunez says that the hearings on the House side on the Intelligence Committee haven't been going anywhere because there's just nothing there and so the Democrats are dragging their feet. They don't want to have hearings until they've got something and they've got nothing and they're not going to get anything because there is nothing there. It's all smoke and mirrors. Now, as many of you have learned and have we already have talked about, and I am going to provide a link for you from a story in the Gateway Pundit, which is simply a story that's been, re been repeated in a lot of the uh, major news and information sites, but I'll provide the link from Gateway Pundit and you can read it if you like. And it talks a little bit about uh, the House Intel Committee and uh, issuing these subpoenas. Now, we learned yesterday that they've issued subpoenas for Brennan and uh, Comey and Rogers, and also uh, Comey will be back testifying again. And of course, Clapper will likely be testifying again, although they may have gotten most of what they wanted out of him in the most recent interview. Now, none of these guys are the target. This is what's important. None of these guys are the target. They've already been interviewed and questioned about most of the things that the House and the Senate both had for them. And of course, as we saw, they all defended themselves and they protected their, their necks, is what they did. Comey is the only, I'd say Brennan and Clapper and Rogers have pretty much done a pretty good job of keeping themselves out of the fray. Uh, Comey has different issues because he, of course, is the one who authorized the, the, the or who sought the Pfizer request based on the dossier. Brennan and Clapper uh, did not fall, and Rogers did not fall into that trap. Or if, even if they did bite on it, um, they did a pretty good job of defending themselves against it and, and basically doing a pretty good job of distancing themselves from the dossier and Christopher Steele. James Comey's locked into that position. There's nothing he can do. He's on record. Um, but anyway, the reason they're calling these guys back is not specifically to target them. The reason they're being called back is to ask them questions of the real targets who themselves will be getting subpoenas. And those people are going to be Susan Rice, John Brennan himself, and the UN Ambassador Samantha Powers. Now, two things here. A very perceptive comment was made by one of my favorite subscribers, Mara. And she asked one question, which I'm going to deal with, and she also made a very good observation. First, the observation she made is that a few days ago when I was going over the Trey Gowdy uh, questioning of John Brennan, I told you that there were certain questions he was asking that were setup questions that in and of themselves, they really meant nothing. They had to be related to something to have any real meaning or, ma or to matter. Well, now we know exactly what that those questions were connected to. There was three questions he asked Brennan. Trey Gowdy asked Brennan if he remembers his last two days as CIA director, uh, did he approve of any uh, surveillance or approve of any unmasking or anything like that? And of course, Brennan said no. He did not say he could not remember. He did not say I cannot recall. He said no. He did not approve any new requests for surveillance, FISA warrants, or unmasking at all his final 48 hours as CIA director on the 19th and 20th of January 2017. Trey Gowdy then asked him another question, uh, which was related to that, and then he asked him the third question, the one that really caught my attention and obviously caught the attention of Mora. He asked him, if any ambassador requested surveillance or unmasking. And basically, Brennan said no. That's what he said. Now, that was a very strange question, I thought, because why would Trey Gowdy ask that question? The only reason Trey Gowdy would ask that question is because he has learned through either intel that he has seen or through classified briefings that some ambassador requested unmasking or surveillance on his final two days in office. That's why Trey Gowdy asked those questions. And now we know 
who that ambassador was, Samantha Power. Now, Maura uh, asked a very good question. What in the world is the UN ambassador for the United States doing requesting unmasking or surveillance on people in the uh, Trump campaign or any presidential campaign or anyone for that matter could be you or I I mean the UN the ambassador to the UN his primary function is to go to the UN and represent the foreign policy of the administration she goes there with a bunch of uh, aides who have been read up and been given notes and her job is to sit there and read from these notes and make statements stating the clear policies of the presidential administration that is primarily what the what the ambassador to the UN is supposed to be doing and in answer to your question Mara what in the world is the ambassador to the UN doing involving herself in unmasking or requesting surveillance from the CIA or the NSA or the FBI well, that's a very very good question and it's a question that Samantha Power is now going to find herself being asked and being forced to answer whether she does it in open hearings in Congress or whether she does it in front of a judge and a jury because that would be highly illegal. There's absolutely no reason in this world why Ambassador Power should have been inquiring to any intelligence agency to unmask or surveil people in a presidential campaign of the party that she is opposed to. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, uh, Samantha Power, she is a very, very nasty woman. She is a demonic ferret. She looks like a demonic ferret. Take a look at her, Google up a picture, and you tell me, if you could picture in your mind what a demonic ferret would look like, it probably would look like Samantha Power. She looks like she's possessed by some demons. She's a very nasty, very mean, very evil, and corrupt woman. She is a neocon. She is heavily backed and supported by deep state Zionist. She is a very much a Russia hater, very much a Putin hater, and obviously very much a Trump hater. But Samantha Power, in her capacity as the uh, UN ambassador, should have had absolutely nothing to do with any type of surveillance or investigation of any sort it's it's not it doesn't uh, it's not in her job description in any way shape or form and it's a very wide stretch even for Susan Rice although she was the national security advisor uh, she, she is a person who would be receiving intelligence not a person who would be running surveillance investigations and operations neither power nor rice should have in any way shape or form been running investigations involving surveillance and unmasking and neither of them should have been involved if they were in the dissemination of any of that information and if it's found that either of them were leaking this classified information to the media either directly or through a third party they're going to jail period so I hope that answers your question, Mara. The answer to your question is no. You're absolutely right that you ask what in the world is a UN ambassador doing being involved in surveillance and to your point, she should not have been. There's absolutely no reason whatsoever in the world uh, that you can justify that she would have done that. But apparently Trey Gowdy has learned from either classified briefings or from something he's seen that in fact this ambassador he was referring to was ambassador Susan Power or Samantha Power she's a very very nasty woman very nasty woman um, and she's obviously going to be as I said they have not subpoenaed uh, her yet and they have not su subpoenaed Brennan for the purpose of finding out 
about what they've been involved in in regard to the surveillance. The questions that Brennan has been dealing with primarily are the Russia Russia collusion. But the House Intelligence Committee, and those were all that was the House Oversight Committee and in the Senate. But this is the House Intelligence Committee that we're talking about now, where Nunes sits. And obviously he watched the hearings with Trey Gowdy. He's obviously a friend of Trey Gowdy's, uh, and uh, they may have shared some conversation. But the target of the subpoenas, of these recent subpoenas for the intel heads, is not themselves. They've already been dealt with. The questions that were to them about them and what they did uh, themselves, that's already been dealt with. They are being called in and being questioned to find out the targets of the, the target of the questioning is not going to be them. The target of the questioning is going to be primarily uh, Rice and Power, Samantha Power and Susan Rice, and possibly John Brennan, because uh, apparently he would have been involved in the surveillance. And of course, Comey is coming back anyway, so they'll get to him as well. But Comey's already, you know, he's locked in. He's already admitted uh, pretty much, uh, and they've already seen some stuff. They're still waiting for more information from the FBI, which I imagine will be eventually they'll get. And so we'll learn a lot more about what Comey had to do with the surveillance, the unmasking, and things like that. But for now, the focus is on finding out what these intel uh, heads of these intel agencies had to do with Susan Rice and Samantha Power. And the reason is, is to get these guys on record. To get them on record, and what do you think they're going to do? Do you think that uh, Rogers or Clapper or any of these guys are going to stick their neck out for Susan Rice and Samantha Power? <laughs> Not a chance. Not a chance. They're going to continue to do what they've been doing, which is to cover their own rear ends, which is exactly what anyone else would do. No, when Susan Rice and Samantha Power find themselves being questioned, and of course we know that Susan Rice is trying to strike an immunity deal. I wouldn't be surprised to see Samantha Powers with an attorney also trying to get some sort of an immunity deal. Because I think they're both guilty of crimes. I think they are the scapegoats. Neither of them are going to stand up and say, yes, I did so because I was ordered to by the Obama administration, by the president himself. There's no way they're going to throw the president under the bus. That does not happen. It will be they who will have to fall on the sword. Somebody is going to have to admit to the illegal unmasking and dissemination and leaking. Someone is going to have to take the fall. And it looks to me an awful lot like it's going to be Susan Rice and Samantha Power. And I wouldn't be surprised to hear some other names pop up. But now we know why Trey Gowdy specifically used that phrase with with Brennan in that hearing and said, did you, un, did, did you have a request by any ambassador? Obviously, Trey Gowdy knows for a 100% fact that Samantha Power requested some masking or surveillance or something in the last two days of the Obama administration. And so we're going to be hearing from Samantha Powers. And believe me, she's not a very good liar. Uh, not a very good liar at all. She's going to be very uncomfortable, and I would expect that she's going to do everything she can to avoid testifying. But again, you know, you can play those games with the Congress. They can even subpoena you, and you can even play those games with them. But if this gets referred to the Department of Justice, which it will, if they refuse to testify, this will get referred to the Department of Justice. They will convene a grand jury. They will appoint the jury, a judge. There will be a prosecutor, or probably a team of prosecutors and investigators. And Susan Rice and Samantha Power will find themselves in a criminal proceeding under oath testifying as to the crimes that they committed. So, that is what's going on. Keep in mind the difference between being the target of the questions and being the individuals who head these intelligence committees. Uh, basically, like I say, all they're wanting to do is lock these heads of these intelligence agencies in and ask them questions about their dealings with Susan Rice and Samantha Powers 
or anyone else within the Obama administration. Because remember, we just learned from the IG report that there was surveillance, gross violations of the Fourth Amendment, surveillance conducted not only from within the intelligence agencies, but right from the White House, directly from the White House. And this is where Susan Rice, Samantha Power come into play. Also, Valerie Jarrett is a person I'm sure of interest that's probably on their list of people to talk to. And of course, let's not forget the former Attorney General, Loretta Lynch, who's the one who signed off on Comey's FISA warrant based on the dossier. She still has yet to receive her subpoena. So I expect what we're going to see happen is uh, we now have these subpoenas uh, for uh, Brennan and uh, Rogers and I assume Clapper and then we'll see Comey coming up as well and they're going to be asked questions regarding Susan Rice, people within the Obama administration, Samantha Power. It's only to lock them in and to get their sworn under oath statement, to get their statement of fact so that when they do subpoena Samantha Power, Susan Rice, and anyone else they want to subpoena in the Obama administration. Once they get them people in, there'll be nowhere for them to go. No no way for them to back out. There's no one else to blame it on. I mean, the surveillance could only have been conducted and approved at the highest levels of one of the intelligence agencies or from the Obama administration itself, meaning Obama's White House. And if you get the heads of the intelligence agencies in, an, in a hearing under oath, and they claim that they did not do any of these things with the exception of Comey. But as far as uh, Rogers, Clapper, and Brennan, they have all basically distanced themselves away from the dossier, from the surveillance as being the ones who instigated it. They, none of them have really uh, come out and stated they did state, uh, Clapper did say that they did some unmasking and things like that, but he never got specific about the Trump administration or what was unmasked or, or what have you. He never really got down to that kind of a detail. I imagine they will in this next set of hearings. But again, these guys are not the targets of these hearings. This is only to get them on record so that when they get Susan Rice, John Brennan, Samantha Powers, and anyone in the Obama White House and get them in front of the committee under oath, they will not be able to say, oh, well, it was the FBI, it was Comey. Oh, it was uh, Brennan, CIA. Oh, it was Rogers at the NSA. Oh, it was Clapper. No, no, no. They will not be able to put it off on them because these guys are going to make sure that they protect their heinies in these upcoming hearings. And so when Susan Rice and Samantha Power and their friends find themselves in these hearings, there'll be no one else they can put it on. There's a very limited amount of people who could have launched these surveillance activities, unmasking, dissemination of information, and of course the really, really big crime in all this, if they can find it, is leaking this classified information to the press. So that's uh, basically what we have for today, Day 90, Towergate. Um, Again, uh, just a quick thing on the Seth Rich. It's still one of the hottest stories out there. Um, continue to watch that every day. There's nothing really new. I'm watching George Webb pretty closely. Uh, there's one thing that's very interesting about George Webb, a claim that he makes that I don't know how he knows this, but he's claiming that Seth Rich was, from the time he left Lou's City Bar to, the, to just before the time he was murdered, that he was on his phone. Apparently he, according to George Webb, there was an 89 minute phone call. Now I have been working and working and working, digging and digging and digging. I even contacted one of the, detec the, the, the detectives back in uh, September of 2016 and even delved into this uh, series of questions with the detective. Of course they didn't respond, it wouldn't respond, wouldn't give out any information. But I've always thought that that was a key uh, to understanding what happened to Seth Rich. And the fact of the matter is, if what George Webb is reporting is true, and I don't know how he's got this information, but if that information is true, that Seth Rich had an 89-minute phone call in addition to, apparently, several other phone calls, 
leading us, basically George Webb is suggesting that from the time that Rich walked out of that bar to the time he was murdered, he essentially was on his cell phone the whole time. Well, if that's the case, then we should be able to, to track every single minute of Seth Rich's last couple hours on this planet because uh, that would all be that would all be available through GPS tracking. If he's on the phone, he's using the phone and he's walking and talking, they should have all the tracking information. There should be no doubt where Seth Rich was for that entire time. So I'm, I'm working on that. Anyway, thank you for tuning in. Uh, happy Friday, and I'll be back Saturday with another YouTube video on Towergate. You guys have a good night. Bye.